religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto un fenomeno obiettivo un fatto reale non è un'idea innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire non solo si tratta di un fatto di un avvenimento ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo più imponente più vasto che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Dieci racconti di solidarietà e aiuto concreto. Storie ricche d'amore, riscatto, coraggio e cura. Storie di persone che donano e che ispirano a costruire una società inclusiva. Una mano a chi sostiene. Storie. Il senso religioso o l'esperienza religiosa è... Innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo più imponente, più vasto che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli perché il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli. Perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Dieci racconti di solidarietà e aiuto concreto. Storie ricche d'amore, riscatto, coraggio e cura. Storie di persone che donano e che ispirano a costruire una società inclusiva. Una mano a chi sostiene. Storie. Thank <laughs> you. 
Buonasera, benvenuti. Good afternoon, welcome to this meeting with the title Aldo Moro, the youth and us, a living friendship. A, an encounter that was strongly wanted for this 2023 edition of the meeting that will let us to dive into a, a gaze, the, a human vision before humanity, before the reality of a great man in our recent history who is Aldo, that is Aldo Moro. So to be more specific, this wants to be, we want to have an event to talk about a figure like that of Aldo Moro, to, to, f to free Moro from the kind of Moro case, our attempt. And I, I hope we, we'd manage to do this thanks to the, the learned help of our guests here. Is that of overcoming the, the, the reduction of the fact in order to try and partly reappropriate that which is a a great moral and spiritual and political inheritance that this man has meant for our country. Already still in a, a few lines of the dis, of the speech President Mattarella gave to the meeting, we can find many of the topics that were very dear to Aldo Moro and uh, tied to his to his role in the constituent court of our country. His desire to, we want to put this at the beginning, at the center of our, of us talk, not, uh, not the, uh, the kind of moral case. And we want to do this not through a kind of purely theoretical discussion, but by recovering fragments of memory. That is to say, that singular relationship which Moro entertained in the, the period in which he was teaching in, uh, in Rome with a, a group of now of, uh, of, the, of the new CL movement at the time of university students. This look towards the, 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 the new Catholic movements at the time, we can potentially say that it was locked in a potentially a different sens sensibility to, to, to Moro's own, but that didn't impede him, that didn't impede this, this curiosity he had. The idea is to recover the understanding of this gaze towards reality through these fragments of memory and to understand how from a similar gaze it's been possible to get to experiences which mean the subsidiarity recognized in our constitution. We think about what about Moro's contributions to the R2, Article 2 of the constitution and now to an, an idea of justice which is which has a, re, uh, a view of re-education now onto the justice system. We'd like this evening to, to propose this to you. Through three uh, exceptional panelists here. The first is Saverio Allevato, who was for a long time the head of, many, of Catholic popular movements in Rome at that, at, in those years. Professor Agostino Giovagnoli, a historian and professor of contemporary history at the Catholic University. And finally, and last but not least, Agnese Moro, who will allow me to not only add a, a very important title here. She deserves no other introduction. She's a journalist and the daughter of Aldo Moro himself. And this dialogue that was so wanted by the meeting this year will be led by Angelo Picariello, journalist of Avenire, and was one of those who strongly pushed for the creation of this uh, meeting this evening. So I'd like to start with Angelo. So first of all, thank you very much, everyone. I'd just like to say that what we're trying to do with this, with this talk here, is 
not only just to talk of things that happened 45, 50 years ago, but something that's extraordinarily contemporary and something that President Mattarella's speech helps us to say this over the course of this this conference. We're talking about one of the, the, the principal interpreters of, the, of that document, the Constitution. So the contribution that he gave to the, con to the Constitution and his, and his life are the, are the same thing. We'd like to, to tell it through some moments that happened in his life, a, uh, a, an active, a living friendship is the title we, like to, we wanted to give this, this conference. So we want to, to say something about this difficult moment that we're going through in this period in Italy now. And so, like Salvatore said, this starts from an experience, from encounters, even in the, now at the beginning where we'll, we'll briefly show a video of Lucio Brunelli and a contribution from him. It's a, an, an encounter, it comes from an encounter I had on my book in March 2020. I don't want to add any unnecessary details, but that, prep, that intervention Lucio prepared, dedicated to Aldo Moro, and he put something on his very popular blog, and that was from which we, that's how this, uh, this video was born. I'll tell you in the end of Aldo Moro, who is one of the great protagonists of this book. The book was, in the book I told Angelo some of the experiences I lived when I was his student at university. He taught penal law in the political science faculty. I didn't miss a single lesson, no matter, he didn't miss a single lesson, no matter all that was going on. He always did the register like it, we did in high school. He came with an armed guard and the, the faces of the police officers who saw him became familiar to him. The surprising thing for me, even to this day, was the, the attention that he showed towards the reality of us young Catholic students, who at the time were taking our first steps. A reality born outside of the kind of official Catholic movement uh, from which he came, Fuci, or Catholic Action. But regardless of all this different language, he, he perceived a, a, a continuity between our experience and his own, a, con a continuity that reached the end of all things, that you could both be young and Christian, with all the, the worries and the needs for freedom and then the, and the anti-conformism anti that's, conformism that's typical of young students, that the importance of culture, intelligence, uh, the fight for the common good, and to be a believer, 68 seemed to wipe away all Catholic presence in the, in the world of youth, an exodus from the parishes towards the left-wing movements. In his eyes, the, the, the young CL in those years represented an interesting novel, novelty. It so that's how it happened, and it, it happened to me a few times as well, to be, to be called together with Saverio to the, to the Farnesina to talk to him. I'm talking about the mid-70s uh, now. He listened, he was curious, he wanted to understand. If I think now, it, it seems incredible to look back on that at the time. Saverio Levato and I, his, his students at, in political science, we'd look for him and uh, we, he, he, they'd pick us up for strange, uh, they, they think we were weird when we said we turned up to his office and we said we had an appointment with him. They'd then call Aldo Moro and they'd let us go past. Uh, an open man, a, a kind of mythical man who looked towards the future. He felt that they that they, they wouldn't be any future if he didn't, if the world didn't develop from the one he grew up in. Moro saved my life, I'm not exaggerating. In 75, I was in hospital, followed by, after I was beaten by some neo-fascist militants. In hospital, the medical personnel, I was one of the many people who was, they were looking for me. They put me in a big room with other 20 ill people and I, I felt abandoned. Maybe I was wrong, but Moro came to find me. He came to look, to, to visit me as usual with discretion and subtlety. When he left, things changed very uh, quickly. And suddenly the care for me was multiplied many times. Thus, jokingly, uh, that's why I say he, he saved my life. 
even for this, every year I always try and visit his tomb in a beautiful little town which f faces over the, the, the Deviri. It's near Rome. Uh, a cemetery in the countryside. A tomb without any, uh, that, that's bare, very bare, without any institutional symbols. And I say a prayer for him, for Aldo Moro. Imagine how, when I heard this contribution, that Lucio Brunelli, uh, uh, I'm sorry that he, he, he wasn't, uh, that it had never been used for the, for the, for the reasons which it was, it was made, but now it's been recovered for, uh, to us to recall Aldo Moro. So we were able to, uh, to realize that nothing happens at, uh, by chance. So we saw some images there, and we have the possibility to, to show you some pictures. So here we are. Here's Aldo Moro, who comes to the Pala Lido with the leader of the student communion liberation members from an, an area, and they had a, an encounter with him. And so we have, we've got to place view in, in, the, in the front row, and there's a big surprise. And then instead, he chose to put himself, no, 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 sorry, I'm just come to listen. And so he put himself so he sat down among the kids, among the, the CL kids, and then there's a, from another angle, you know, you, uh, uh, the, there's so something unique about this choice in, in the panorama of that time. And th there it is. Here, and here's, here's the meeting. So, how how was it? You you were you were at the the Palalido at this this venue um, with. with uh, with the Right Honourable Moro at this time. So you didn't expect that he came? No, certainly not. So thank you all for the invitation. I, I try to tell you a part of what Lucia said. Lucia said more of half, half of what I was saying, but uh, <coughs> he's already, he'd already, already, he's pretty much said it all for me. But the, but if you are a lover of the, the things that the speak, <laughs> you got the speak, you got a girl to do the speak instead of a boy. So uh, thank you for Don Tantadini and his, who made this beautiful video uh, and, and for the people who made it. Thank you. So I wanted to report, uh, I, I, inter I interviewed him in uh, uh, Professor Renato Moro, um, the, uh, his teacher, and he, and he said, I, I was invited to a, a, a meeting of Fuji and I realized that on, on one side, um, the sitting down, listening to all of it, taking notes without making take homage to anyone. He was a teacher who understood his subjects and, and how they were in society. So, this happened to us in that March in '73. We went to in the beginning of March. Lucio and I, uh, we, we knew we'd got this this big convent, national convention of CL University students, and we invited him. He, he thanked us with a with a smile. He didn't say no. We didn't, and we didn't know if he was coming or not. He, he, he said neither yes nor no. So I was, I was there, as you can see, in, uh, just above, behind the, behind the stage, and all of a sudden, in the central corridor, um, there were three or four kids with, with a, with a bloke, uh, who, a man who, and the, who's going along the corridor with them. Uh, so I was young, and I could see very well those days. And then, as, as they got closer, I could see some white hair, and. Uh, uh, and so I thought, oh, it's Professor Moro. So and he hadn't said whether he was coming or not. So, so exactly there. And then in a, in a very brief way, because I think that he wasn't going to say yes. To, he didn't say yes because he thought we'd, we might uh, arrange too much, uh, too much fuss about him. So he came in this private way. Uh, and uh, and he, he went, we, we, we said, come and sit down at the front, and he, but he wanted to sit down in the, amongst the young people. He followed everything. He, he, was, he was listening um, almost in religious silence, and he went away just as he had come. That was Aldo Moro. So here's Professor Bottiglioni giving one of the speeches there, who was a researcher in La Sapienza University, and in some way he managed to speak to Moro, and he knew that we know that Moro was a 
was a student of Maritain, and um, Bertoglioni was a, a young researcher of Del Noce, and they spoke a lot. And he underlined that the encounter didn't happen on the level of an I ideological identity or theological identity, but on the, the level of a realism, of the, the reality of every day, you know? So you, you, you saw, you bumped into this reality, I think, you, 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 we, can, we need to realize this, that the, think of the difference between, of a value, that this thing wasn't born for putting together equal people, but for make different people meet each other. And he and his, the diversity, I think it was important. So yeah, this is certainly true. The thing that, that after 50 years, uh, at least that moves me still, um, is seeing how how the professor Aldo Moro, he wasn't just a, a, a simple professor of, of, of law, but he was also a statesman of highest level, a political leader, uh, one, one of the greatest of that period, and he, how he treated the kids like us, who were a bit strange, because indeed we were a bit strange back in those days. We turned up in jeans and long beards and Eskimo hats. Uh, and. and so you, the, the, the marshal, who, who's his, the leader of his escort, who was another stupendous person, he, he, he often stopped us and said, sort yourselves out, clean yourselves up, and then you can come and see him. And so then the professor would speak to us with, with a, very, a lot of affidavility. And, and so after then, they never stopped us. And so sometimes when we used to go to the Farnesine Palace, there were, oh, there were always policemen and so on, who we had to wait like half an hour before we could get up there because we, we weren't uh, suitable people, if you like. So one time you were dressed up in your jeans and your Eskimo hats or whatever. And so in, uh, early one morning, you had to go to the Farnesine and you turned up there and you weren't very credible. You make, you're trying to make me t tell an anecdote that uh, that is, isn't really to my advantage, yeah, but anyway, yeah, it explains what we, what I saw, what a lot of people saw, that there was a big organi a Catholic organization, we really organized, but then I come home one evening and my, my mum's on the phone, she'd, she'd pick, had a call from the his secretary and said, uh, Minister, so go, go, go to him, yeah, on 7.30 you must go and go there because the minister wants to see you. But sorry, hang on, 7.30 in the morning, are you sure? It's 7.30 in the morning, because in, in the Rome, if it's not nine o'clock in the morning, nothing happens in the, uh, in the public system. So maybe if you're lucky, there's somebody there at nine o'clock. 7.30 seemed a bit strange. But, uh, so uh, in 73, I did, you know, obviously we didn't have mobile phones, so I thought, who, who can I call uh, at the 7.30? So in those times, there were some, they were phone booths uh, where you had to find the right token and put the token in, and then you could make a call. So we started. So I called Lucho. I, I, had, a, I had a big Vespa motorbike, um, <coughs> or a scooter, and so I went with, 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 to pick up Lucho. At seven, quarter past seven, we were there at the, the enormous piazza in front of the Farnesina, which is the, the, the administrative center. It's like a massive cube of, blo of white marble, white marble. And so they, we were there next to the, the stadium of the, uh, I can't remember what it's called, the uh, St Stadio di Marmi, with the uh, Olympic uh, set up just beyond there. So, uh, so I'm, I'm sorry that it was. So we go to where the, uh, the policeman w w uh, would typically stop you two kilometers before with a hand that's pretty close to his pistol. And practically, we, we got there. Uh, and he said, no, we don't want anything. We, he, the minister's called us, and, and so we've got this appointment. Uh, it's 7.30, 7.30. So sit yourselves down. More or less at, at 9 o'clock, somebody came. And in fact, the uh, opportunity, the interview wasn't at 7.30 in the morning, at 7.30 in the evening. So big, uh, great Catholic organization. So we, we get on the bike, we go back again. Um, mum had, uh, had really said we did the, did, the, did the shopping and at least mum would have killed us and then uh, we go back in the evening. So this, the encounter with President Morris, with the, oh, he always he listened to everything. He asked us, how, wants to know how we were, what we were doing, how, how, how our initiatives were going. With, if we'd managed to, to be in university, if we had problems. It, uh, so much so that I think that after the Paralido, I, 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 he called Consiga, uh, my friend told me this, 
to, to, to put himself in contact with the national responsibles, um, to put himself in touch with them, to see in what way um, to guarantee they could give us some, some way of acting, because there were, they were ways, a period that was really difficult for us to get into university. So you had other encounters. Georgia Borka, in an interview that came out um, again from Traces, um, he interviews Giussani a, a couple of days after the first meeting of Bruno Popolare and says, is it true that, that, that Moro followed you closely? Giussani says, said more or less like this. I'm not sure if it's just the journal summing it up, but there, there's certainly Giussani in there. It was just like this. It's traditional in the movement to invite to its meetings in those times the university professors. And this was in th March 75. More, more, and, and others were, were invited as professors. Fanfani uh, didn't turn up. More, more would come often to our meetings. He listens, he follows, and he doesn't say anything. And now it seems like a, maybe a, a bit cutting that judgment, that of Giussani. But in reality, it's ex you can explain it with Article 2 of the Constitution, where he puts in the word, phen a phenomenal word, uh, the, which he, he himself wanted. The Republic recognizes and guarantees the inviolable rights of man, both as an individual and in social groups, and now it, it, as, as a way to express his personality. So you did well to, to describe that behavior that, that he had, because it wasn't a respectful behavior towards CL, it was respectful towards the, the social formations, social groups, thinking there was subsidiarity, that they were already some realities, so pre-existing to the state. So he, as a man for the constitution, went to learn, to understand, to listen, and so whatever comment you know, might have put the politician's hat on that thing and limiting perhaps its own freedom. Isn't that right? Yes, yeah, certainly. So the thing that struck us most and still now after 50 years strikes me is that this great humili humility of, of Moro and his capacity of listening. He wanted to listen, particularly to young people. Certainly he understood that in listening to young people that there's something for the future. It's like the society was moving, and he, he gave always the impression that in some way he saw, maybe he saw us perhaps like, like his own young years in us during the fascism, during the hard years, the years of the war, the years of the reconstruction. He, 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 he was there for, for a few years, the, the, the leader of the president of Fusi, with, with Montini, the future power of the sixth, Paul the sixth. And it wasn't that he spoke, he didn't speak because he had nothing to say. He had a lot he could have said. So there's a record, so there's a record that, that he could speak for six, for six years, for six hours at a conference. So he could speak if he wanted to. So he was there, he wanted, he wanted to listen. Um, it, it, well, there was a positive and a negative inside social, civil society, and particularly the young people. So the photos that we saw before were kindly given us by the archive of CL, and here's one, a photo that I think came from Gabriel Otoleva, who was a, a young man who's, who found himself there, and the same thing, but seeing from his, his, somebody, his companion sitting next to him. And so it's, it's very interesting to give us a bit of the, the sense of what we were saying. Uh, as Rocco Bottiglioni said, behind there's Emilio Bollicini, uh, so who, who's missing a, a couple of days bef before to, because of seeing how emotional he was. Um, Bottiglioni said that in the discussions that he often had with Moro, that he said, you're a bit integralist, but better to be integralist when you're young because then, then you can become cynical. Uh, so he had, he had this, this spirit of a, of, a, of a warrior, if you like. Um, so he wanted you to look, uh, look ahead, but have the courage to stay in university. He appreciated your courage. So uh, book, th this uh, comment was uh, between the intellectuals of a certain level. He, he never said it to, to us, kind of normal people. So uh, he never said to us that. that. So yeah, it's true in, in that uh, in, in, in the young, those who want a, a bit, uh, a, a bit uh, hard and fast uh, are perhaps uh, too cynical. 
But think of that context there. You need to, to realize what is the context. The context of that is university hegemonized by the left, by, the, uh, by, by uh, those following a possibly violent path. And so the, the, the communists, the young communists came here to, to do meetings. So, so there was a context uh, which was in jurisprudence, the fascists were in charge, um, who then massacred, massacred Lucha. Um, so we Catholics, when the experience is true and authentic, we're always in, in the middle of it. Uh, we, we were in the middle. On one side, there were the ones, and the other, on, on the other side, they didn't like us. Um, uh, uh, and and the, there's many getting votes from the, from the democratic Christians. And so we, we were there. Uh, the context was, wasn't uh, an easy one. You know. And so you can call us, they could have called us integral East. We were trying to go ahead, uh, like, like young people. So it's important to contextualize this episode that's very serious, which happened for Lucia Brunelli in a, a unique way, unique way in, in 65, 75. Um, so he, he wanted the Catholics to, to, uh, to do a, 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 a list for the elections, uh, to put up a slate of candidates. Um, but the the most very important thing, which I'd like to, that I'd like that you recount to us, is the fact that he substantially, the, the dynamic with which he behaved with you, so here we, we we're seeing, we're, we're seeing, the priestly ordina ordination of somebody in this in seventy three, and here we can see the the white quiff. Uh, I, I, maybe you, you believe it, or just take our word for it. And Thomas Olatronico, this priest, was um, recently uh, his canonization course has just been been opened. He he was a bit the the um, the, the person sent by Giussani uh, in, to, to this place um, and to to Rome, uh, and he was he was there with the pre first communities in Campania as well in Puglia, and in Basilicata where he came from. He presented himself to mass at mass, really referring to to the contribution that, that uh, according to Lucio Brunelli. So that there was a, a military type there who, who said that he, he was there with three soldiers at one of the churches where he said mass in that period, and. Th these soldiers didn't know anybody. They were look, waiting for somebody from Seattle. There could be 68, 78 people in that church, I'm not sure. And d he met them to, d to get to know them. And who does he meet? But Aldo Moro. D d dear soldiers, how are you doing? Are they, are they looking after you? Uh, and and uh, he's thinking, where, where, will I, where do I find myself? I turn up to this place and there, there's Aldo Moro. So this shows something about this pioneer uh, epoch and the interest that he had for this, this, this new reality. So one thing, with the religious sense of CL, his relationship there, um, the, the, in this restarting that CL w was doing, uh, start, that, that touches us on school community, the religious sense. Um, you, do you recall this period at university? Certainly. So many times, he, so a few times he came to Mass, uh, um, with the, among the, with the, uh, the Church of the, of the Friars there, and the, the Church of the Saint Maria Tastevere, and so one particular thing, he he came to Saint Mary of the Stairs, um, and almost the end of March of, of May, sorry, and we we were there waiting in to let somebody in, and then Moro came came forward without his escort, it seems, I think, uh, it, I don't know if he'd just come off the bus or whatever. There's certainly no escort. I don't think he got off the bus, but uh, never mind. Um, and he was, there in, in, he, he was there with his coat and hat and, and, and his scarf, and he was thinking, how's it, how is it profess, possible, Professor? You were already in short sleeves, and, and you're there with your, with your, you're there at the end of, end of May with your winter coat and your, and your scarf. This shows how the form wasn't important to him, neither for him nor for us. So just as he didn't ju judge us, Based, based on our, our funny haircuts or whatever, we didn't judge him based on how he was dressed at the end of May. Because there was already a much deeper relationship, much truer, a f truer friendship with him. And so this, he came, he came to every now and again to our masses, um, as he did at the, uh, at the, as he came to the ordination of Don Tommaso, who was the first university friend of him. 
who became a priest, and to understand if, if we were alone, the only Catholics involved in, in civil solidarity with this dimension, this sort of spiritual dimension. We, we, we were kids who, who actually went to Mass to, the, to confess and did, went to the sacraments. Yeah? So this was, it wasn't that only did to go to do political battles, etc. So he also thought there was also a further uh, impassion, passion for us. Um, so it made, it made us, I think, even more friends of his, I think, that's, uh, certainly. So the last thing that I ask you, Mariano Ormiti was a, a very important figure. A, a, a policeman of the of the area, a local cop, who became a, a union leader because he wanted, um, who because he he knew this, this the stories of many places, um, and many young people went went into seal and a few ended in, in the armed struggle. He was struck, um, uh, and as was reported in, in a nice book, that he found. That you, you found, in, he, he, I think he was shot, and uh, there was just inside his, inside his uh, package, just just a, um, a rosary and an apple. So there's a similarity between these two figures. I want to finish uh, just like this, with this, my testimony. Mariano, uh, he left home uh, uh, in that morning in '79. He, uh, uh, Christmas, the the eve of the Immaculate, he, he was shot by the Red Brigade. He, he dead in the arms of his he died in the arms of his colleague and praying to our lady and, and the, the, our, our lady uh, Mariano was a marshal of the security the anti police anti terrorism police and in, in that in that area where we lived around the city and he came regularly to school of community which we did at Chinichita um, he, he came he, he, he came here he, he, uh, with his police car, he left it there. Came, again, he came to hear what we had to say. After an hour, um, he picks up the car again and, and went back to, uh, to his anti-terrorism work. Many years later, Seppi, who was there, said there were people that he, of the people he'd sent to prison who every Christmas and, and Easter went to, uh, went to um, greet him because he, he, he looked after their families uh, after, of the people he sent to prison. Mariani made concrete the uh, teaching of Professor Moro. I, I make this parallel to show that I think this is the Christian mir miracle. The miracle of the Christian experience is this, that it's not a problem of roles that you can have in society. You can be a great statesman like Moro, a, a great political leader like Aldo Moro, a great professor like, like Aldo Moro. Uh, or a simple policeman for the anti-terrorism unit of public security, but the humanity that is expressed by both of them was new, was identical between the two of them, the way in which they brought themselves in, in, in front of reality. This is the great morality that comes from the Christian experience because the equality at this level is at this level, not at the roles that you have, but in the humanity that comes out. Thank you. Thank you, Salerno. We took some extra time to say that, but I, I think the images that we, we, we've shown have helped us kind of centre on the theme on hand, uh, very much an alive friendship. And it, it's relevant to the moment we're living now. Professor Giovagnoli then. Aldo Moro was a, a figure, a, a Catholic man of a, a, law, a, a lawmaker, and at that time was also an acute politician who interpreted in a, in, a mo the, the, in a more productive manner than any other. There are articles of the Constitution that, who, that talk about him. He was key to that process and probably his, uh, as these images show, his impact was that he saw even in, in every single student the, the whole world, he was able to, to arrive late to, to meetings of the of the council of ministers and he was happy to be a bit late to those official meetings but because he he, he was able to see inside people when he was there and he was able to propose some incredible reforms and some important developments for our country as a as a, a catholic lawmaker of the of the constituent court and many other things and then we get to to 78 the period in which he, he meant the most for young people 
So uh, obviously I'd like to start by thanking everyone first. Now, all of those who've organized this, this initiative and who have invited me, because the, the figure of Aldo Moro is worth being remembered. This, you've already all understood this by what you've heard, but it's worth saying. So even then to, to, to add more value to what we've already heard, I want to underline that we're talking about the personality of a uh, of, an, of a great uh, a great man, one of the most one of the greatest of the history of of the Republic in Italy, and thus of the, the history in Italy, of Italy as a whole. Who then who who did everything that we we heard? He, by putting all this together, we, we we're faced with the the personality of a, a a huge man, truly a great man. So naturally, the the, the the making of the drafting of the constitution uh, Mattarella cited some of the articles of the of the constitution uh, as you've already been reminded articles that Aldo, Aldo Moro con con made a major contribution to the first thing I'd like to say is that Aldo Moro was 30 at the time more or less so he was he was born in 1916 and the the, the constitution was from 46 so he was very young and he listened with great respect, with great attention, you know, making constitution, making La Pira, Toglianti, Nenni, many great politicians of the time, major figures who had a great political experience on them, behind them, who'd participated in the, the, the resistance, they'd been to prison. And so the, the, how much this man, this young man listened, not only because of his own intelligence, which is it's naturally out of the question, or of how upright he was, but also out of wisdom, because the, this 30-year-old this 30 -year -old man was able, of, able to express with a, a capacity to synthesize information. You can already see in the work of the, create the drafting of the Constitution, the able to bring together different perspectives not in a, in a silly way, but in, a, in kind of compromise, it's much more than this. It's seeing the converging of different interests, finding points of convergence. And to, to struggle naturally, to struggle a lot to find these points of convergence because they're not obvious and then you know, political clashes don't help this, but already this very young Aldo Moro in the drafting of the, the, of the constitution made it very clear what he'd then do, go on to do for the rest of his life. He'd bring together, let's say, the, mo the most impossible, the strangest things, the most diverse uh, wills and desires. We're talking about a very devise, uh, divided Italian in which ideologies were very important. The division of the world, the cold world, and all of, and, uh, and all of these kind of contextual points. So someone who, beyond all of this, was able to, to, to build points from the the legal standpoint, the juridical standpoint, but we don't understand, it's, it's hard to understand these points if there isn't a humanity that builds them, a humanity that builds these points. Obviously they are, they're fabricated, these political points there, they can be the points of politics or of law, but there needs to be a humanity that, that brings together human beings, especially those who feel the, the most separated from each other, the most divided. And I think that Alamora's entire political history shows this and you know he was a minister he was a, a president of the council of ministers he was secretary of the Demo christian democrats he was a minister then again of foreign affairs which was a, he did an amazing job there in the 70s and then at a certain point he became so important that that there wasn't a post. There wasn't a post for him. He was. He was kind of the director of Italian politics. He was the man who said what needed to be done. Precisely because other people saw in him this, this deep authority that he had, accompanied naturally by this capacity to encounter people that we've been talking about. I'll add a, a brief story here. In. 68 he was the president of the council of ministers he dedicated an entire morning with to, to meet with some stu young stu leaders of student movements there's a the protests at the time in 68 some very violent protests at the time and 
Aldo Moro lets to know that he, that, that he wants to meet these leaders of the youth movements, and he listens to them. He spends a whole morning, he spends a, a whole morning in which he did nothing but listen. And in the end, he, he, he asks a question. He says, okay, so what do you think I should do? And they tell him, well, Mr. Vice President, it, it's pointless to send the, the police to the universities. S students have some desires. They'll protest, but it's, the police won't resolve any problems. And they, make, they give off a bad impression. This isn't the point. And Aldomoro said nothing, naturally. And the next day, Boato says, we, we didn't see any police anymore. They never came into the university. They stayed outside, etc., etc. We don't know if it was the result of this, in, of this meeting, but that's what happened. So this capacity, you know, to let's call it, uh, to use a kind of rhetorical expression, a man of the people, Often Mora was represented as a, a man of, of, a pal of the palace. There's nothing more incorrect than this. His lectures, his talks, you know, they were complicated, they were difficult. They were, this myth has kind of passed. Uh, modestly speaking, th this, isn't, this isn't what happened. He, he spoke clearly, naturally, he's, he's got complex reasonings because the context was complex and he was trying to keep together all the different pieces on an international, local, Italian level, even of his own party, which there were many, many pieces to bring together, and he struggled to juggle them all. So naturally, there was a, the, the complexity that, that was born from complexity, but there's all, there was always, you know, first of all, a, a profound humanity, and the, the capacity and the desire to, to encounter people, to meet people. Uh, this is why he was a, a, such a popular figure. Another thing that's not that's not present in the in the that's present in the collective memory is that he was a, he was a, a part he was a member of the De Christian Democrat Party, which isn't so popular nowadays for many reasons, and that's fine. But we've got to make the effort to see what were the parties, what was Christian democracy in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and things changed later. And maybe this is one of the reasons why of the the, the for the encounters with CL and with other groups. And there was that incredibly in, uh, intervention by him in the autumn of uh, 78, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly. You know, on the, on the, a kind of new moment where he announced himself, which kind of opened a season in which he he, he was moved to the, the, the to the fringes of the Christian of the of the party. But he he was still there to he, he went to go and meet the young people. It was that season in which. The, the party kind of closed itself towards these new young youth movements, but he indicated the fact that they need to need to listen this the, the process of the young people. And since the party leader didn't do it very much, he took charge to be the interlocutor with these youth movements. And this will probably this surely integrates into what we've already said. Absolutely. And since this, I've, I, I knew this question was coming. I did my homework here, so I. A quotation from his from his discussion. It's a very it's a very famous speech. A famous speech that he made at a, a meeting of the of, of the Christian Democrat Party at their national their national meeting, the twenty second of December. Angelo now is a, he leaves a kind of, he lives a kind of a symbiosis with a, with Aldo Moro. So. New times are announcing themselves, and they're moving rapidly as never before. These are the words of Aldo Moro. And then he underlines, the, the, the revindication rises, the sensation that injustice, that poverty, that in, uh, insufficient conditions, that indignity and lack of power uh, are, in, are now intolerable. The, uh, the, the widening of hope to all of humanity the division of the rights of others, even of the, the most distant, uh, need to be taught more than our own. These are the signs that he, he gave in those moments. And he said, at the end, it's a new, there's a new humanity that wants to create itself. And it's an irresistible point of history, a new way of living the human condition. So you, you can imagine that the richness of Aldo Moro's sensibility, who was, who was able to to read through the chaotic conditions of the 68 with all its structures, its violence, its context, but 
he saw this in it, this, this humanity, this new humanity that was, was being made, this irresistible uh, part of history. And so, as you mentioned, he even paid a, a personal price for this because it's, it's easy to be the, 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 the tip of a, of a party, the, the figurehead, but he, he was aware of, these, uh, of this human connection. He saw society going in a different direction. And he could obviously say that his, that he had other objectives, that this road was different. But let, let, here we need to look at ourselves. And he, he asks, he questions the balance of power. And there's always these kind of questions. But he, he, he pulls himself out of the, out of the, the topic. He, he, he moved, he moved himself to the margins of the party to discuss this. Not because he, he didn't believe in the importance of politics. It, it, this should be said. Moro's a man who, who gave his life for politics. But he gave it in this way that we're talking about now, because for him politics was a was a service. And I want to say something that's always struck me. In, in the days after his death, I I, I met a, a great figure, which was Don Anciani Moncalbani, which who is a, a priest a man who knew Aldo Moro like he knew also many other important political figures and he said well, so now we have a, a, a martyr of politics he saw in Moro a man who'd given his life as a Christian for politics and this this tells us something that to me is very important obviously it tells us something that maybe I haven't said until now but that's it's fundamental so to understand the politician Moro as a politician, you have to stand Moro as a man, and you also have to stand Moro as a Christian. So Moro is a politician because who only came the way he was because he was a Christian. His his speeches revolve around this, the the kind of the, the burning anxiety of his faith, the the search for the synthesis for him, it wasn't only a kind of out of pragmatism. It was a search for a, a, a deeper reality than the one that was shown in our, in our history. I seen him, someone who made a Christian journey of, of research. He, he searched for something in politics, something which, which sounds strange, and it, it shouldn't, it, it is, it, it's a complex thing to think about, but I repeat, you can see in his speeches that there's always this, this search to, to, to face reality, to solve problems, because within them he saw something else something further he saw the ma the hand of god i'd say we can conclude like this and would you like to add something no no i'm very curious to uh, to listen so i just want to say one thing because this is a a relationship not with Selk it's it's interesting to hear Jusani's words because he he never had a uh, Moro never had a, an, an interest with the the heads of CL but only of actual people and destiny put him uh, led him to uh, to meet the kind of average people and this continued through through other people this encounter I but I owe much to the friends, to the, for my friendship with Agnese and to fellow students at my, in, in those years with me. And um, Agnese reminds me that in the, the last classes, they were dedicated to, to topics of, of justice that, that puts man at the center. And which, as we well know, you know, Moro didn't, didn't share even through only certain uh, his new kind of corrective vision if you don't give a, a second chance even to those who have a, a a life sentence you contradict yourself that's what I wanted to say finally is to to give the space to your slideshow he is always a man of unity in an, in an interview in 77 in the CL magazine at the time when Fiorenzo Tagliabue was the director, he, he, he did two things. Firstly, he said that they're working to, to use his, to kind of rebuild his inspiration. He, he said that he wouldn't uh, 
lose his spirit, wouldn't lose his... And then he asked if there were, there were two, um, two souls, two spirits, and he said that the, maybe these two spirits aren't there. That is, he was, he was a man of dialogue, a man of unity. He wanted to communicate. When we talk about dialogue, I'll kind of move straight into your first slide. Thank you. Uh, okay, do I need to press the screen on? Okay, great. Okay. So thank you all for this invitation, for all the things I've heard, which I've, which I liked a lot. It's and often that often many people are critical about my father, because I, because I, I care about him and I, I love him. And any any erroneous word about him makes me cross. So, but but here I didn't hear them, and uh, that's because it's the context of making people. Where it's not so about little saints or some or about a, a dead person. Here, here it's about uh, he's talking about a live person, a living person, which I've heard it from everybody here. Not about the the uh, a sort of holy little image. I'd add, what would I add to, to what the things that have been said? Just my look on things. I looked at this man as a daughter, and, and as, a, as a young daughter, because when he was killed, I was 25 years old. And so my, my recollections of him are from a young person. And so the, what characterizes him? It was a, a man who loved to laugh. And, and so, this is a, a journey uh, that, that uh, in, in Lapland, a diplomatic journey in Lapland, and so they took him to see the, the, the Lap people. Uh, and he, as you can see, he's dressed in, in, a, in a really uh, unthinkable way. It's, it's really, he's really out of his place. In the world, he's always out of his place. And so there's snow. He's got the little shoes of, for, for the city. He's got a light coat. Uh, he's all dressed nicely, sure, you can say, yeah, yeah. But, but he, he, was, he was almost pathological in being neat, smartly dressed, but his attention is going to the, to the reindeer. Because cause he, I think, Th th he was interested to see, you, to, to know who was this reindeer. So th there's like he had like a dialogue with this poor creature. So it wasn't that he was, it wasn't he didn't have a particular animal animal love, but uh, he was he wanted to see why the reindeer was the reindeer was so patient. I think there's a feeling between the two of them. So he was the person who believed in the strength and the power of words the words that were said and words that were listened to. And there's, there isn't a limit to where the word can reach. It's not that you don't have to speak just to those who are similar to you or to those who you, who you know would help your career. So he could even talk to the reindeer, I think, or, or at least look at it. So this truth and this trust in, in the word, which took him to politics, because politics is made of words, of dialogues, the capacity to explain things and to listen to, about things. So this is a, a, a nice image, that of listening. So there's something that always interest me, interested me about him. Another thing that always left me, that I'm a witness of him, certainly a witness about, is his dedication, the strange dedication that he had. This, this horrid photo that I took, which you can see, this is our house in the countryside, in Torre di Berina, where, where he and now I'm, my mum are buried. He's there outside the house on, on the terrace in, on a Sunday, and if he can manage to overcome the shock of, his, of the hats that we have here, which are truly horrid, but you, you'll see on the table, on this little table, it's a Sunday, that there's, there's a pile of papers because they are the ones that he, in that Sunday, had to examine because, whatever, his life was full of many things and it was also that he had to read thousands of pages 
and and now I don't recall a, a single Sunday, a single holiday or Christmas and Easter in which there wasn't always work for him because he, he had this was this this may be even ill form, if you like, I'm not sure if it's very healthy, that, that your life is dedicated to something. And so if you are responsible for the public life, then you, okay, you, you can go out to the countryside, you can look at your, your roses, your yellow roses that we still have in the countryside, but after that you get on to with reading all that stuff. And this dedication, I think, was something that was almost mysterious. How can you do it to be so dedicated every day of your life? And I, I'm, got, I'm 71 years old. So I've got 10 years more than he had when he was killed. And I know how difficult it, it is to have this dedication, even in the things you love most. And so how could he manage to do days like this where he went out in the nine in the nine in the morning, and went out, came back, went out again, went out in the evening, in and out, and then on a Sunday, you've got the the pile of papers to do. Where does this dedication come from? This is a question that I gave myself, I asked myself, because it's not a not a, a an unwanted dedication, that as if as if you're beating yourself about. It's, there's something more in this dedication. It's seems like a dedication that's made for at least three things. And this is the explanation I gave myself. One is an inheritance, uh, a heritage of a hope. Uh, to use it with the words that came to me from his mum. The lady was called Philistica. She was from Calabria. It's, it's the, my, my cousin Renata wrote a, a wonderful book about her and expl that explains a lot about him and about our family, she was, she dedicated this idea of, of thoughts been one in life, the, 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 that these could, could give you a new position in society, that you, that you they didn't have to be defeated by life. And this for him was a hope that my father picked up exactly from her. You're a reader of, of his. There are passages in which he says almost word for word this thing. And it's a heritage, it's a hope. So maybe the hope he also transmitted to us in some way in, or in the disaster that we had lived after that for his death. And there is a debt because he has a debt against towards the the kids of his age, um, which had the same experience, but who are dead because he was he was young in a season that was very difficult. I'm thinking of a of a, uh, a letter that he wrote in '38 that we who are left and we don't know why, because why 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 did they did, couldn't manage and we did why didn't they get through and we did, and so he was also for them, and so a heritage, a debt, and I think there's also that that's something that you guys have spoke of, the affection for persons, for the interest he had for people, the interest for common, normal people. And it was a, dedic a warm dedication. It was hot. Maybe, maybe you couldn't, couldn't do anything else but that, because that was, that was, the things that, that uh, were closer to his heart, really. Uh, a third characteristic is that which you described very well, the new humanity, which I think is very, very sweet in this photo, because in his time, the new humanity, the, 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 the newest humanity was in Africa, which was decolonizing and uh, trying to find its place in the world uh, for what, what was due to it. And he dedicated a lot of time with uh, the foreign minister ministry to Africa, and this, I think, this question of new humanity was one of the points that he had in common with the young people. Everything that you have recounted uh, was was, and then there's others, other stuff we could talk about. 
was in sharing this hope that the a different world was and was within our reach, and we could do it. It's part, I think, of that, that leader of the, of the 1900s, of the 20th century, who've seen this new humanity. And because it's a characteristic that, had, that has come to light, was this capacity of seeing what's not there, of seeing in the disaster what, what other people see, everybody sees as a catastrophe, like 68 seeing in it the new thing that's inside there. This, I think, was truly a characteristic that's very evangelical uh, of him. And so these three things, I think, are very characteristic of him. And what I can also say to you is this funny dad who then also took us to the circus or took us to see things that were important for him. We were coming out here from a place where we'd voted. In my family, there was this great tradition that the littlest one of the family, as, as soon as he knew how to hold a pencil in his hand, would accompany his dad or his mum, who went to vote. And he or she put the, the mark on the, on the voting slip. And voting was a, uh, was a feast, was a party, a great party, a great festival. And so you can see how me and my, my brother, we're proud to be, to be there, that we went to vote with dad, with mum. We all dressed up nicely, and, and they see in my festival clothes, very horrible. But anyway, it's important, it's important. And so the, this is my brother John, Giovanni, the little one, and the, 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 the one, uh, that one there is me. The, And then there's this dimension of his, which was very precious for him. He, he's very, very bound to the Eucharist, his, his special relationship, uh, which maybe uh, I think uh, get used with some seeds and fruits of it. And then uh, there's also the ridiculous. This is a, it's a thing at, at the at the fish on the fish boat. We in the summer we're going to uh, to summer and. As you can still see, he's got his jacket and tie on on the fishing boat, and he therefore obliges everybody around him to to wear a suit, <laughs> to stay, in, to to do no less than go in their jacket and tie. And uh, also had the capacity to give a bit of space to us, because you can see that that little child is Giovanni, and so we're always there. We're always holding our hands, carrying us. So he wanted to keep us close. And that's not the only absurd thing. This is on the beach. This is the beach. And we were on the beach, we used to go like this. And so he had his motivation, which is, and often I thought, I said, but you represent the Italians, and the Italians have a right to be represented in the maximum dignity possible. Italians have done they, they are, they, f they form an integral part of our family, the Italian people. We've never done a holiday abroad. In Italy, there's everything. We don't need to go elsewhere. <laughs> and so to go, to, go into, to go for a swim, he was a great swimmer. He liked it a lot. And he could do kilometers. Uh, he went to, could go to an empty spot and go there. And then finally, he could go, go for a swim. Um, I have some great memories of that, how, how good he was. He took me and my brother into the sea. He, we'd, uh, on our tummy, he'd, he'd swim on his back, and, and he, the sea was a great place for us. Mm. And then, okay, here we go. <laughs> this is in Macarese, in the beach there, where he, he, he often went. With, he went to visit the, these workers here. Uh, uh, it seems like a fake photo, but Truly, it's not a montage. He may wish it was a montage. But uh, one of the st you couldn't find a strainer person. And he here's my mum. She resolved the problem of the beach because she t got the pay got the license, the driver's license for a boat, and this uh, this motorboat, which it seemed like a suitable extra luxury thing to him. It, uh, I, I couldn't imagine how he managed to buy this thing, but my mum 
took my dad uh, out far, uh, away from the away from the coast, and there he could s swim as much as he wants in in peace, and she, w without uh, affecting the dignity of anyone. So my my family was made also of other persons. So this photo I love it a lot, and here. His R.S. and Leonardo Domenico Ricci, uh, who, who died in a car with him in Via Fani. And it's beautiful the way in which they protected him, the way he wanted to be protected amidst the people, with nobody who impeded him from having contact with, with those who were his partners, because the people wasn't something that he wrote. Uh, the, the good of the, po po the popular party was this, was that the people that were an integral part of the politics. And so this is those two, Domenico Ricci smiling and Aracelino Radi. He got there to, to stop that something went wrong or whatever. Uh, and some said that he wouldn't get pushed over. And it's a photo I'm very affectionate for. Leonardi did it. Um, and because how, how, how often I used to sleep on his shoulder my, my dad's working. Uh, maybe, you, uh, yeah, he was, wasn't reading a comic there. Certainly, he was, he was working because he worked. And the young people you know, who see some of the things that are, uh, even the, the the young people who'd stop him on the road. Um, so one stopped him on the on the road to uh, tell him what he'd. Well, uh, he entertained him for for twenty minutes there about what was going on in Italy, and he listened to him, and they asked him, what do you do? And and this, and uh, what, what do you do then? Re stayed, stayed really in me, this thing. Stayed with me. This is to say that his love for young people wasn't a thing from the last moment. These are his pupils at the gymnasium, these in, in, the, in the natural format, you can say. And here he is, here there are many photos uh, for him, uh, some we've seen already. This is a, a trip to the criminal psychiatric hospital. Um, and you, c you could see what it means. And here, a trip, an absurd trip on, on this, uh, this this steep path. And, and I have no idea why they did this thing, which, uh, which uh, was cost, could cost much rather than a, a scab on your knee. The pits of all type. This is something I love very much, which this, the, the, this uh, hope came from a great collective action. This is his, his card for the Constituent Assembly. And to understand what it was, un understood that the, they didn't have money t to go. To, there's a stamp there on top, so they didn't have money for it. And, and Italy, which reconstructs it on, on top of other bits of paper, this was. And here he came from an epoch that, that where there was fascism, and for him, the young people, they were the first free young people, he'd say, the first free generation, because there's nothing in the constriction about them, no constraint, he, he wrote in, in a discourse in La Resistenza. And this was very interesting, this generation of ours. Um, and so this is a title from the Corriere del Sole, how they did once upon a time. Uh, how in, in, the, in this little title, you, you can get the whole plan. Uh, Mora announces uh, a plan of renewal of the structure of the state and of social life. So there's a design for a long time. There's, everything's in there. And there, so Shelba and another 29 didn't vote uh, confidence in the government. So you can see it's not, not easy to do politics. See the summer people that he lived with, normal people. And here's a, a thing I love a lot uh, beyond those rhetorical things. This is him and Berlingua. And I love it a lot because they're in a, in a place. There's some things on the floor. We're not sure where, the, where they'd gone for this thing. But they don't, they're not looking at each other. But you, may, you can understand what it means to have the responsibility of a country. There's something spectacular, um, because how those two men had in their hands 
the, the, uh, the fate of our country in, in, in a very dramatic moment. And, and there they are, the country is this, normal people. There's the international context, and everything is the, f the photo of him listening with Minister Grego, the Greek minister. And in a, this is a dialogue in action. And while he would meet with young people and listen to them, then there's the international thing, and then there's this, then there's the other. And it was a life that was spent, expended. And this photo is a photo, as you can imagine, this, this hurts me, this one, seeing him under this flag, but I need to see it. We must look at it, must look at this photo, because we must not have any fear about looking at our past, even in its its least nice aspects, because we are us, nevertheless. And this photo, this photo says many things to me. It says to me, obviously, when I see it with my, my daughterly eyes, it shows me the worry that what's happening to him. And, but also, it says many other things. Imagine, I imagine, I, I perceive it, what he must have suffered in seeing not so much his life that was abandoned on, it, on his own, and you know, so we have to live life on our own, but, but seeing how his party, the party in which he'd lived, for which he'd passed all those Sundays and reading those, those things instead of going to, for a nice walk, that in a few days they renounced the two bases that that had held up the political the popular party until then. Tr trust in a word, because as soon as you say that you can't treat with somebody, you s you say that words uh, uh, can only say doing th when we're doing nice things, but when there's something serious, words don't work, and that's. Uh, and it's not by chance that today diplomacy has no space, because still now there is the idea that words don't words don't help. Instead, words are useful. Words change things. Words are important. Words work. And another thing that that made me very sad that I, that I found very bitter, as you know, it would do the same for any any young daughter. Imagine him who'd lived so deeply. The idea that it had been changed in a few minutes, that the, the priorities had been changed in a few minutes, that those that he'd set up with so much work and so, and so much of himself in the Constitution. So Constitution puts a first place put the persons. We're there to serve people, good, nice, whatever, beautiful, whatever, even if they're in prison, whatever. They're, we respect them. We recognize the sacrality of that person. And in that moment, instead, what had became important was the dignity of the state. So we were back to the fascist idea that the state is everything and people are nothing. And this wounded me. I imagine how much it could have touched him that people from his party had did this. And so for me, this photo says something else. In those days, terrible days, the only thing that, that consoled me in some way was my certainty that that Jesus, that who, he'd, who he'd spent time with, um, would be with him. I've always been sure that in that cell, in that cell he was never alone. And, and that he was a free man because um, you know, we'd had, like as a country, not so much as a family, but I, I won't take that, but there's been a lot of confusion. Uh, but he managed to be the only free person there. And so I, I say the truth of these things as they were, even when, even when it wasn't hurt. This is something important because being free it's one of the signs that, that, that is left by being close to Jesus. Being free is a Christian thing. And for me, I have to say that his life in general 
But above all, this fragment that's so important of his life that many would have liked that it wouldn't be taken into consideration as part of his life. This was really, it's as if nobody can separate us from the love of God, neither when you're in palaces, when you're with young people, when you're thrown into a cell for something, you're, you're, when you've been, a, a, when you've, ne when you're accused of something that he'd, that, that he'd never done and thrown into a cell, uh, then it's as if, say, what I heard today makes me think that that phrase that he wrote in one of his letters, that I will, be, I will still be there, will I, uh, as an irreducible part of, of, of protest, I think, is perhaps in a little way true. Thank you. I'll take a 30 seconds here to say something that I, I can't not say. I know how difficult it was for you to to accept this invitation. A few years ago, you had a a great uh, excuse to not come because yeah, you had a what I hope was a a little accident. That I hope wasn't a very wasn't wasn't serious that makes you struggle to walk. You had a very easy. Uh, occasion to have just either joined online or have not come at all and I think you've you've let the centrality of the person wa win once again by coming here with us today so uh, I'd like to thank you in the name of the meeting so we, we made a promise at the beginning of this discussion and I think that we've uh, dutifully maintained this promise for everything we've listened to and I'd say even more for what we've seen which has been which, which, which tells even more the the power of the wor of words and images are on full display here so what we've lived because what we've lived this evening isn't content it's an experience that's that that's moves us moves all of us here and an experience that was was de that gives us a challenge gives us a task about about it tells us about today about the the questions we've heard about that, that it tells us of a of a duty and a responsibility today and now in which all of us can be called in their relationship with their every day with their day-to-day -day lives and that's how we can say that this friendship with Aldo Moro is a is an alive a friendship that's alive it's living and it's a, it's not it's a celebration not a bad memory i'd like to add that this was made possible thanks to a place in which this friendship could become an experience that's daily, a uh, daily experience, and thanks to the participation of many people in a place like the meeting, for which the need to sustain the meeting in the many ways that's still possible in these final hours in the Fiera, is the chance to to keep allowing that this friendship will remain alive. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to our our guests, particularly Agnese. Yeah. Grazie, penso veramente no, no,
fratelli e sorelle, costruite senza stancarvi mai questa civiltà. Lavorate per questo, pregate per questo, soffrite per questo. religiosa è innanzitutto un fatto, un fenomeno obiettivo, un fatto reale, non è un'idea, innanzitutto non è un modo di sentire, non solo si tratta di un fatto, di un avvenimento, ma del fatto più imponente e più inestirpabile della storia dell'uomo. Più imponente, più vasto, che neanche il fenomeno dell'amore dell'uomo e della donna, che neanche il fenomeno del rapporto tra genitori e figli, il senso religioso è un avvenimento che pone, che afferma o che ricerca l'orizzonte entro il quale acquisti senso anche il rapporto tra l'uomo e la donna, anche il rapporto tra genitori e figli, perciò è più vasto, perfino di quelli. Dieci racconti di solidarietà e aiuto concreto. Storie ricche d'amore, riscatto, coraggio e cura. Storie di persone che donano e che ispirano a costruire una società inclusiva. Una mano a chi sostiene. Storie.